from the beautiful cold hills of Lake Placid in South Central Florida, this is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters, and today is Friday. It's April the 4th, 2014. It's, uh, uh, it's, hey, we made it to Friday, and did anybody notice that today's numerical date is 4414? Do you think it means anything? Well... Make up whatever you want. Anyway, I hope you're ready for some Far Out Friday Night Fun this evening. Michael Horn is back with us this evening. Michael was last with us on November the 19th, 2013. And you can catch all five of his previous visits by going to faroutradio.com and clicking on the Archive Shows graphic on the right side of the page. Michael is the official American representative for UFO contactee Billy Meyer, a man who is arguably one of the most controversial figures in the world of ufology. His UFO photographs are strange and compellingly beautiful, and later we'll talk about how you can get a book of these photographs. Debunkers have unsuccessfully attacked these images as fakes using astonishingly weak arguments. The photos were taken long before the days of easy access to computer graphics software. These were the days when photos of UFOs were typically fuzzy and blurry, and special effects photography required advanced darkroom skills. Billy's photos are crystal clear, thus making his detractors claim that the ships are photos of models. If so, that's mighty impressive model and darkroom work for a man with only one arm, no model shop, no darkroom, and no assistance. Many claim that Billy's accounts of meetings with the Pelagerans are purely fictional, but what's hard to argue are Billy's writings of many years ago where he tells of things to come in the near future, things that have since come to pass. So what we have so what are we to make of Billy's prophetic writings? They're kind of a showstopper. Michael's new film, and did they listen, addresses Billy Meyer's prophecies, and Michael's here with us this hour to talk about the film and Billy's writings. And you can keep up with all of Michael's work at theyfly.com. Michael, are you there? Welcome back to the program. Hi Scott, it's a pleasure to be back. Thank you. I'm I'm glad to be back after your move and uh, ready to go with you. I, you know, this is I think, like you said, what is this? Our our fifth or sixth uh, appearance together. Uh, sixth, I believe it is. There you go. <laughs> yes, Michael. Before we get into your film, I'm sure that you have uh, you're aware of the massive earthquake in Chile. And then the powerful aftershock that was itself equal to a big quake. Our friend Robert Morningstar sent me an email this morning uh, informing me. Now, Robert's very much onto this, and he he tracks this stuff. And he informed me this morning that in Oklahoma, Oklahoma is resonating with small quakes, three of them the last day. It's also a big fracking state. Just overnight, there was a 4.2 magnitude quake in Guaymas, Mexico, uh, then there was a 2.5 uh, quake in La, in La Madra, California. Earlier, there were two quakes in El Salvador, and there were small tremors in the British Virgin Islands just off the coast of Puerto Rico, where the fo- where, uh, which followed a major quake in Panama on April the 2nd that was a 6.0. He closes by saying that the ring of fire is ringing like a gong. So I guess we could call this the gong show. Uh, Michael, you're, you're, you're way up to speed with Billy's writing. So what did he have to say many years ago about seismic activity during our time? Well, it, it's, uh, Billy goes back to the fifties with that. But, uh, since you just mentioned, you know, fracking Oklahoma, of course, let's remember has been for the longest time, a, uh, heavy oil production area, you know, and people didn't think much about it. We just take the stuff out of the ground. And, of course, you add fracking to it. But in, um, in 1976, 1976, 38 years ago, uh, Meyer was warned about all this. And uh, there was a contact, it's contact 45, and it's spelled out. And one of the things she said in there, uh, this by she, I mean, the, the extraterrestrial woman, Semyaze, who's a playaron woman, said, and there's, there's stuff that precedes it about the destruction of Earth, but I'll just get into a couple of pertinent sentences. Again, this is published in books and documents verifiably decades ago. That is to be understood in this way, she says. 
that Earth man exploits his planet and robs it of the fundamental life energy in that he robs from it the underground oil and gas and the most diverse ores. This leads to the fact that the earth suffers shifts within, which leads to enormous volcanic eruptions and earthquakes because slowly the earth collapses from within. And she said, but the same process is also created by the erection of dams and similar structures. Can you say sinkholes, earthquakes, you know, and volcanoes? This is stuff that Meyer published decades ago and warned and warned and warned about for the longest time. But, you know, the ambition, the plain and simple, the greed, the short-sightedness of humanity and wanting to just ignore this guy, you know, this seemingly irrelevant guy who was not irrelevant at all, well, this is what we get from it. And now we are going to be getting more. As far back is 1951. Now you're going back, what, 63 years? Mm -hmm. Landslides and avalanches, as well as earthquakes and sea quakes, as well as every kind of storms will prevail. Gales and typhoons, hurricanes and tornadoes will increase ever more in their numbers and will become ever more violent and destructive. 1951. So Meyer has, has for the longest time, the longest time, been trying to warn people. And his warnings, you know, continued after that. Um, In 1958, he he warned again of the earthquakes, the sea quakes, the storms, uh, terrorism, violence, all this stuff, specifically telling us to stop it. And... He has warned for the longest time as well about living near sea coasts. You know, I have family and friends in Los Angeles, and I'm in conversation with a lot of them right now because mm-hmm. you know the quake that hit there, which was only like, what was it, 5.1, 5.5? 5. 5. I'd say like only, you know, because I was there for a 7.1. There's going to be a mega quake in L.A. sooner or later, and uh, I have posted some of Robert Morningstar's information on my own astrology blog because I've got a couple other people who've been very accurate astrologically who are in conversations on that. And I just, you know, I'm hosting it. uh, Meyer and the play Iron have said that most terrestrial astrology is very flawed and imperfect, but nonetheless, there are people that have come up with some accurate stuff. So I've made a place for that. Uh, tell us for our listeners like well like me <laughs> who have never experienced an earthquake since you uh, were in LA during a 7.1 what was that like well, I've been in a few of them in LA um it's it's very strange it depends on the earthquake like i think i was one of them was a 6 or it may have been a 7 i remember my daughter and i we had our bedrooms just to, you know on either sides of the communal bathroom there and suddenly this thing hits, and my daughter said, Dad, did you feel that? I said, yeah. She said, what's that? What was that? I said, that felt like about a 6.1. It might have been, there was one that was about a 6.1. And it was something real close, like in the morning, we looked, and I guessed that one. But that 7.1 was a, a pretty much of a jolt. Now, the difference is some earthquakes are rolling phenomenon, and while they're unsettling, you, you, you can feel like you can roll through it. You don't feel as terrified. When you get one of those jolts, and it's a strong jolt, and then there's other you know, aftershocks and all, it's very, very unsettling because you really realize how vulnerable you are being a little creature on the earth, and that that's going to move, and you cannot control anything about it. And you know, depending on where you are, you don't know how safe you're going to be. Fortunately, the structure we were in was... Very safe, and we never even, you know, had broken dishes from any of that stuff, although she had some goldfish on the floor for a while until she could pick them up and put them back in the tank. But that was the extent of what we had in terms of damage. But I'll tell you, it's you get a jolt like that, and it's a serious wake-up call. People panic. You know, some people are injured or even killed in those. So, Mm -hmm. 
it's not a, a pleasant feeling. I saw a, um, a a collection of videos the other day of the quake that went off in L.A., which was a you know relatively minor compared to others. But this one of the videos, it looked like everything was shaking from side to side, as if the whole. I think it was a surveillance uh, uh, video inside of like a, a coffee shop or something like that, and it looked as if the coffee shop was a movie set on a platform that could be pushed back and forth from side to side. And of course, everybody came unglued, and stuff is falling all over the place. But uh, uh, they're uh, they're really something, they're really something. Those side to side things, when things start moving, you know, and they, it can be like there's a jolt, and then everything shaking side to side. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, like what you saw, it's it's very unsettling. And um, we don't, we know now. I mean, Meyer's information from the from the fifties on up through the seventies. He said, look, man made. Are uh, you know uh, man-made disturbances and disasters are going to be the order of the day because this stuff is now 75% caused by pre uh, previous and continuing abuse of the environment. If you know we don't get it, okay, we don't get it, but we are going to get the consequences. This stuff is going to hit. It's going to continue, and um, you know, like. Sensible advice, honestly, is to move away from seacoast because it's not just going to be L.A. There's a 9.0 that's coming from, uh, let's see, it's going to hit the upper, you know, the, the northwest, Cascadian subduction zone. Mm -hmm. And that one Meyer predicted in um, 2005, and three years later, the scientists at OSU came up with the exact same prediction. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, and it's going to shake and bake. Um, and then what are we going to do? You know, we're just going to have to realize that it's, it, in a sense, then it's too late. We're going to have to go through the payback and hopefully be wiser. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, is there something beeping on your end? Yeah, don't worry. Somebody else is trying to reach me. I don't know who it is, and I'm not oh, going to okay. interrupt our report. Okay, all right, good. Uh, we we weren't sure where it was coming from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, I, I don't know why it keeps on doing that. Usually the thing gets forwarded and it probably will ring on my cell phone next or something. But anyhow, we're here and uh, we're keeping it up, you know. Wow. So this, yeah, that's the problem here. It really is. We, we've abused, we, human, humanities, we've abused the planet and there's payback, you know. Mm -hmm. It, it occurred to me quite some time ago, Michael, that the oil that we're taking out of the ground, uh, although it's been pretty much proven in the last uh, decade or so that it's that it's created in the earth by a by a natural process and is, for all intents and purposes, almost endless. Uh, that's not a reason to take it out and burn it, but it actually acts as a shock absorber uh, for the uh, for the planet's innards. And you take the stuff out, and it's. You know the analogy is that um, if you've ever had an older car where the shock of, where the seals and the uh, valves inside of the shock absorbers go out and all the all the oil inside of them uh, leaks out, uh, you don't have very much shock absorbers and it's a pretty rough ride. Well, yes, exactly. And see, Meyer was told that uh, long ago exactly that. Plus, this whole thing about the um, uh, the Earth making the oil, this is something. That the play Aaron told Meyer. Now it's not inexhaustible at the rate that we use it. We've actually hit peak oil, according to them. But they did say this is a natural, organic, you know, pr production of the planet. But we're far outstripping the ability of the, you know, um, of the environment of, of the Earth to produce that. And we should be getting off of it. See, in in our new film and in in one I did it before as well. Meyer speaks about the answers to the energy situation. And he said very simply, um, deep geothermal is now, you know, this is present. It's available to us. It is a virtually inexhaustible, non-polluting, non-damaging source of energy, inexhaustible, that could take over a production of electricity and thereby heating, all sorts of things, just by converting, you know, and, and, and producing 
uh, the, the energy from deep geothermal, which fortunately is being pursued in some places, like Iceland, mm-hmm. even in Switzerland, and I think in California there's a company or two that started to get into it. But this, you know, companies like Shell Oil and the other oil producers and miners and all that, they could convert instead of, you know, pulling out all the, the shock absorbers for the earth, as you're pointing out, we could be channeling up this inexhaustible heat energy, getting rid of refineries, pollution, trucking, and infrastructures, and, and running stuff around on tankers and the rest of it, and, and utilize synthetic uh, you know, lubricants and develop other products, even from silica, sand, you know, things like that. It's, it's just short-sightedness and greed, people thinking that if they don't pay attention, the problems will go away. And now we understand the problems don't go away, you know. Well, there's always there's another uh, big uh, big time usage for oil, and of course that's the manufacture of plastics. But uh, ba- I think it was back in the early 30s, Henry Ford had a very large because uh, this he had a very large farm in Michigan, and one of his crops that he was experimenting with was hemp, and uh, he made uh, several prototype Ford cars with hemp plastic bodies. And uh, hemp grows like crazy. Uh, that's why it's called weed, folks. That's also why George Washington told uh, told uh, farmers back uh, in the early days of the Republic, grow hemp. It's a cash crop because it grows so darn fast and there's so many uses mm. for it. But so many oils and lubricants and paints and basically anything you can make out of plastic, you can make with hemp, um, from, with the hemp oil. And uh, this stuff will grow just about anywhere on the planet. And it's quite amazing. So, you know, do we do we absolutely not need any of the oil that we take out of the ground? I'm sure there's some things, but man, there's so much that, that's connected to it that's just dirty like crazy, and it even drips over into into the fracking. I, I remember seeing a, a documentary about fracking, uh, and it's not just it's not just you know the blasting of those uh, chemical laced water that goes down into the ground. It's the continuous stream of trucks. Huge tractor trailers, almost nonstop, twenty four seven. You know, trucks bringing in the chemicals to go into the ground, and trucks taking the the polluted water out of the ground. You know, out, and it's just continuous trucks. And of course, they're all diesel trucks. You know, and suddenly people who had you know lived in wonderful, pristine areas uh, have uh, have a highway of tractor trailers running continuously. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know. And again, just to come back to it for a second, um, silica, and I am not, I know some people that were involved and they were, I don't know what happened with their project with a large company, but, uh, you know, silica is also a fairly abundant, and unless, it, unless I'm wrong about being able to use sand for silica production, there, like you're saying, there are alternatives, even algae can be produced for a uh, an oil type, you know, or a lubricant type of uh, product. And that can be produced in great abundance as well as for food sources. So these things are going to probably happen more independently over time as the structure falls apart, as the system falls apart, because it cannot keep up, uh, you know, propping itself up from the top, overbuilding and, you know, it just has a destiny that is saying, you know, it's over and it's crumbling, but you have to have other things that come in to take the place. You don't just try to pull something down from the top. You've got to mm-hmm. focus more on supporting and building what you prefer. I'm curious, uh, Michael, if all the time you've spent with Billy and reading all of his, uh, his writings, did he ever ask the Plajarans, so how do you folks live? Well, sure, but what in in what way specifically? It's not that there's a lot of information, but for instance, what do you mean? Well, you know, what do you make your homes out of, and you know, how do you move around, and what do you you know, what kind of raw materials right. do you use? Well, from what I understand, they use uh, some synthetic uh, materials. I think derived from the earth, but they they have an abundance of ways of making things that don't destroy or pollute. Their homes tend to be spherical or semi-spherical, like domes, and in many cases they are apparently built with a type of shock absorber system into them for when uh, 
quakes and, and such things would occur because quakes are naturally occurring on any planet. We just are simply having and going to have an extreme number uh, you know, of in terms of frequency and intensity, it's going to be high numbers. But they they live um, they have their own gardens, but they also have extremely uh, highly developed, non toxic, non polluting, non chemicalized, uh, automated gardening done by machines. You might say androids and automated systems that even when they are uh, working their their earth, they don't go in and rip things up, they have machines that actually use more of a suction process and then in, uh, implant into the earth any necessary you know, seeding or elements without actually doing damage uh, from above the, the earth. It's like these things that hover above and, and, and do this you know, for their more commercial stuff, but they get their own hands dirty. They work uh, you know, in, in the earth and in their own gardens too to keep their connection to, their, to life and sustenance for themselves. Uh, some of them even build little things like cabins for themselves. Well, one of the uh, ETs that Billy has known for <laughs> decades now has his own cabin. It's just for him. Uh, you know, it doesn't allow anybody else there, a wife or anything. It's just he's got a little cabin out in the woods that he made from logs, you know, kind of the way we still would do it on this earth, uh, put it together with his own hands and... These are people that have space travel as well, you know. They don't have roads as we know it because their craft are all more, you know, of the anti-gravitic, you know, magnetic type of craft, <laughs> including on their world. They don't live in anything resembling the overcrowding and proximities that we have to each other. They allow a lot more space between uh, their homes and their families than we do because they know it's very necessary for peace and sanity for people to have their space, to have their own garden, to be able to go and walk in nature. So their population is a lot smaller too. Wow. And they you know so what you're said, saying, we gotta take a break, Michael, but what you're saying is that even the Pajarans need a man cave. <laughs> All uh, right. We're going, to, we're going to take our commercial break, and we'll be right back. If you're just joining us, uh, Michael Horn is our guest tonight, and we'll be talking about his new film, And Did They Listen? His website is theyfly.com, and we'll be right back. And we are back on a Friday night here on Far Out Radio. Michael Horn is with us this evening, and we're talking about uh, the uh, – Prophecies of Billy Meyer, the UFO uh, UFO contactee from Switzerland, the one-armed guy with those amazing, amazing photos. Michael, I was poking around your website, and I came across a page that you have here. Where you've got a book, the UFO photographs in color. Um, is this are are some of these photos the pictures that you first saw? Um. Yes, of course, uh, and I think that this book. Uh, are you talking about uh, through space and time, or which which one do you mean in particular? It's on your website, and it's the uh, uh, Wedding Cake UFO Photos ebook. Yeah, but you know what? I'm going to be look, quite honestly. The new Wedding Cake UFO photos that you can see for free on my blog are much better. Oh, and yeah. Um, my blog is theyflyblog.com, and if you like, do a search on their uh, WC UFO. Uh, actually, one of the ones that's listed, I think, on the right-hand column, what we can learn from the WC UFO links to all of the photos uh, that have been recently revisited. And there's going to be a new book out sometime this year from Switzerland where they have digitized hundreds of of the, you know, all of the UFO photos, from what I understand, and People are just going to be feasting their eyes on how amazingly good, you know, Billy's, Billy's photos are. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your film. How, how long has it been out and, you know, what, are, what, are, what kind of feedback have you been getting from it? Well, uh, you know what I want to do? This is going to sound really weird, but I want to turn off the tea kettle because the water is boiling. <laughs> I'm going to do okay. that real quick. Okay. Go, go for it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just starting up here. For our listeners, Thank that's... you for your patience with this rather oh, unusual moment. It was out of reach for me. Um, let me answer your question. The film officially 
was ready for distribution on, on January 21st and only available off my website. Now what's happened is a company called Yekra, uh, which had promoted the serious documentary. People may have heard of that one from Stephen Greer. They have uh, my film available so that people have the option of buying the film. It's, it's like $25 for the film. Or they can have it for like, what is it, like three days they can watch it for five ninety nine and mm-hmm. you know and save twenty almost twenty dollars. Whatever works for anybody's fine with me because see this film is getting we're getting just the greatest feedback. I've got a a, a page on the on the front page of my website. There's a link to some of the reviews for the film and people have really liked the film because it's very comprehensive and also we focus a bit you know, on what to do. And by that, I mean, look, Meyer is the most abundant, specific, prophetically accurate human being who has ever lived. I I say that from my own research over 35 years. People can find out for themselves if that's true. And the film, you know, makes pretty good case for it. And you start to see what we present in this film, you're going to go, well, you know, okay, I can't imagine anybody could know all this stuff. But Meyer did. And and this is why a lot of people haven't heard about Meyer. It's the most suppressed story in all of human history. It is the main thing that the entire UFO cover-up is about. The cover-up is not about Roswell. It's not about lights in the sky and Dulce and hearings in Congress. That is all smokescreen stuff. And I say that for a reason. This government that people want to badger for the truth, for the most part, it doesn't know it. There are people in military intelligence that do know. There are people in very high levels of the black operation you know, programs, and they know the Meyer case is real. The Vatican knows the Meyer case is real. And this is why a lid has been put on it such tremendous efforts to try to kill the man, suppress the story, discredit him. Most people, even involved in UFOs, don't know about Meyer. And that's because the disinformation slash entertainment approach to UFOs has been an unfortunately successful one. It's marginalized the truth. So in our film, we present enough of the stuff that anybody who really wants to know the truth is going to get it straight in their face, and then they're going to see presentations in there on what it is that these extraterrestrials and Meyer himself are teaching, if we want it, basically for free, how to get ourselves straightened out. But, of course, it involves personal responsibility and thinking and work on our own part. But, you know, it's... There's no secrets here that are really being kept from us. We've got the main teachings, and, and, and my website has a lot of it for free. So I encourage people, you know, to get the film to, or, or to just download and stream it and watch it or, or watch any of the free stuff or read any of the free stuff. This is, in my opinion, the most sing, singularly important event in human history. And that is incomprehensible to people because the human mind says, well, if that's true, I would know about it already, or our famous leaders and scientists will be talking about it. But that part isn't true. They wouldn't be. They're not because it's too destabilizing to politics, religions, belief systems, all of the control mechanisms of our world because it encourages self-responsibility and true human freedom. This sounds suspiciously to me, uh, Michael, and I'm not a religious person, but I am a spiritual person, but this sounds suspiciously similar to me, Oops, to another oh, prof- to it's another sounds- prophet that was here a long time ago. Oh, you mean maybe about a couple thousand years ago? Something like that, yeah. To, to someone who was here then and in, in the Middle yes, East? Yes, show, showing a way that is largely ignored, that's relatively simple, and the powers that be, have, or you know, or, or expanding on it, or changing their ways. Well, you know, now that you've hit on it, the information in the case 
is very direct and plain. And of course, the, the paradox here, the irony is you can't prove the following. However, it is said same spirit that has been incarnated in our past as six other major prophets, including a man named Emmanuel, whose name was changed to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That spirit is incarnated one more time in a prophet who lives in Switzerland. <laughs> so there's a reason for the similarity. Oh, we're on thin ice on that one, but that's okay. We don't mind. We have music playing in the background, Michael, so we're going to take our commercial break. Uh, we're, as we go into our last uh, segment here with our friend Michael Horn, and you can go to his website, uh, his new one that he just mentioned. It's theyflyblog.com, and you can uh, get the movie what we're, we're speaking of for just uh, $5.99. You can rent it, or you can buy it for $24.99. Okay, we'll be right back with more conversation with Michael Horn. Alrighty then, we are back and uh, rolling into our last segment of some Friday Night Fun here on Far Out Radio with our friend Michael Horn. We're talking about his new film, And Did They Listen? Gosh, Michael, for five ninety nine, you could uh, uh, you know, have a bunch of friends over and have a Billy Meyer party. Yeah, three nights running. <laughs> so, when you rent, so when you rent it, you get to, have it, you get to watch it for three nights or, th or uh, three days? Yeah, that's what I understand, 72-hour rental. Oh, okay. So that's... That's pretty good. They, they want to make you know their stuff available reasonably, mm -hmm. and um, and then I think they even do a thing that if you rent it and then you decide to buy it, they're going to they apply the rental price to the purchase or whatever. Oh, and wow. if people uh, you just, if people want the other thing I offer is if they buy the film out of my products page on my web website and they mention your name Scott, then I'll include another free full length uh, feature DVD. In, with it, so they've got their choice. They can rent the film for three days and, and buy it from Yakra, or they can buy it from my site and get a free DVD if they mention your name. I just want people to, any way they'd like, to learn about this and to learn about the teaching that is so important for us as, as um, evolving beings if we want to survive and thrive and, and figure out what it's all about. That's very generous of you, and thanks for that. I appreciate that for our listeners. I'm just reading off the uh, the cover for our uh, friends who are listening but uh, aren't uh, uh, near their computer. The uh, The film covers Fukushima, climate change, wars, 9-11, terrorism, oil spills, environmental disasters, and civil unrest. You've got Fukushima at the top, and uh, for, for me, I mean, I've been watching Fukushima since it first happened. And when I first heard about earth, you know, major earthquake and a tsunami right next to a, to a nuclear power plant complex, I went, oh, my God, this may well be the kill shot. Um, you think there's any solution to this thing? Well, it's a, I mean, within days of Fukushima, Meyer was told, within days, that the radioactive particles had already gone as far as North and Central Europe and that the seas would be contaminated, the food chain would be contaminated, the air, the land, the water would be contaminated. It was already a ultra worst possible case scenario. We're two years and plus from that. It's not getting better. There's information I've seen online. I think Dr. Helen Caldicutt, who's known for her work you know, fighting against all this nuclear insanity, she says at this point that virtually all of Japan is contaminated to mm -hmm. some degree or other. I mean, it's mind-boggling to contemplate. And the, and the Japanese government is in complete denial. Uh, no one officially from Japan can speak about this or they can be arrested under, you know, secret, uh, uh, you know, violation of, of state secrets acts and things like that. This is going on right now unstopped unabated tons of this stuff pumping into the oceans, it's going to affect us for generations to come, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And the same is true of the BP spill. That didn't go away. That's gone into the, the whole you know, food chain and, and, and chain of life on the planet. And that's why we feature talking about it on the film, because people are going to be referring to this film over a long period of time and going, oh, wait a minute. This guy Meyer was talking about this, and he got it right back then, and now we're hearing about it again years later. 
This is the problem. We even have an illustrated version of the BP disaster information in a comic book form on the Internet to get people, you know, who just want to see the pictures and get the idea and read the words. We're trying to get this, this message out. You know, there is no, there are no aliens on the planet, folks. There's no alien abductions. There are, when those things happen, those are secret military. This is all very clever disinformation to keep you from the Meyer case. Because these people are real and they've been monitoring us for a long time. They cannot step in and save us or, you know, take our responsibilities away, but they've given us every possible piece of information. It's up to us. With regard to Fukushima, as I've been watching and studying this, there's a visual disconnect, I think, for most people because although there was a, a small hydrogen gas explosion there, there wasn't a colossal nuclear bomb type explosion. And unlike uh, what happened in Russia, uh, there wasn't a, you know, a destroyed plant you know, with pictures to look at. Um, at this is different. The, uh, the uh, uh, reactors have melted down. They're already through. And this thing is just melting and, and spewing out uh, radiation. You can't see it. Uh, they're pouring water on this thing to keep it to keep it relatively cool, and then the uh, radioactive water is now running through the ground underneath and back into the ocean, and it seems to be perpetual. And this is the really frightening part about uh, what's going on over there. And if you if you want to you know really get chilled out, you start thinking about all the rest of the nuclear power plants around the world that are uh, yeah. positioned in precar precarious places. And then you want to start talking about the price of, uh, you know, corn today because it's just too darn much. <laughs> well, you're right. The thing is that Meyer was also told that the problem is that they're using seawater to try and do this cooling, and it's corrosive, and it's going to create other problems. So now we're realizing that's true. And uh, this is so extensive and so diabolical the fact that humanity is asleep to this and deliberately kept asleep, all the people that are suppressing this, they must be really hallucinating that they're not that they are somehow immune from reality. This is the real deal, and it's flowing out. And while you and I can't go over there and stick our thumbs in the dike and stop it, we must wake up to reality. And to you know, like you said, all these other power plants are in precarious locations, coastlines, earthquake faults. Meyer said, hey. You, most people have been kept in the dark about other accidents because they haven't been as big, but they've occurred. Mm -hmm. Not just Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, but other places, leaks. There's stuff going on leaking in New Mexico now. I mean, we're insane to use this stuff. It's, it's poison. We cannot contain it. So all of this hype and pumping and cheerleading for nuclear this and that, we're now going to pay the piper on this one for generations to come. Genetic mutations, horrible effects, killing off of the seas and the food chain, contaminated seafood. I mean, and the seafood is taken up by birds as well. I mean, folks, we live on a ball, you know. Now, again, I don't want to close this out on doom and gloom. It's, those are real problems. What do we do? Well, let's get educated about reality, how to think so that we can think our way through a lot of the stuff that bad thinking has created in the first place. The core of the Meyer case is a teaching. It's not extraterrestrials. It's not UFOs, and it's not even about prophecies. It's about self-responsibility, how to think. These human beings that Meyer is in contact with are, are fully that. They're human. They've gone through their own grief with atomic energy and wars and all the rest, and they still make mistakes like human beings do, but they just happen to be light years beyond us in knowing how to think and live responsibly, and they want to pass that on to us to help us help ourselves assure our own future survival and not wipe ourselves off this planet. Very noble enterprise on their part. Uh, wow. We've got about a minute left. Michael, uh, do you have anything um, new you're working on or something you'd like to mention? Well, on my blog, people, as I, we said before, they can see these phenomenally beautiful, newly digitized, newly analyzed photos 
of the wedding cake craft, the WC UFO. You'll see this thing is darn, this is as real as it gets. One photograph taken by Meyer in 1981 that appeared to be just a golden glowing ship against the black background. One of the analysts put it in Photoshop, cranked up the brightness and the contrast, and lo and behold, it's a real craft hovering over a road with grass on the side of the road at night. Film photograph. He had no digital stuff years ago. So this type of stuff is all freely available, and if you want the DVD from me, if you buy it off my website, I give you a free additional one. Just write Scott's name in there. If you want to just rent it for three days and have yourself a party or several, it's there, five ninety nine. Get informed. Read all the free stuff that you want, and you can write me emails. I'll answer them. Just give me a week or two to get back to you. And that's my story. All righty. Uh, I want to squeeze this in uh, if for our listeners. If you go to theyfly.com, uh, somewhere on the home page there, there's a video that you can watch. It's a video that Billy shot, and you can see him off to the, to the left side. And it's, there's a hillside that goes up, and there's a single tree. And you, at first, you can't really quite make out what's going on up there, but then he zooms in, and there's the wedding cake sitting in front of the tree. And then he zooms out, and he zooms back in, and he zooms out, and there it is. I mean, when he zooms in, you see it, and there it is in, in, all, in that glorious old-style grainy video format. Uh, kind of yep. hard to kind of hard to cheat that stuff these days. And you'll see photographs that he took. You'll see him in that video taking photographs, and those photographs are on the blog. And the, and you get the detail, and you say, "My gosh, that's a real big, beautiful, authentic craft." It'll blow your mind. Yeah, it does. It's neat stuff. Michael, thanks a lot for being with us, and uh, we'll do it again soon. My pleasure. Thank you, Scott, and I look forward to it. All right, take care. I'm Michael Horn, and you can keep up with his work and his new blog, They Fly Blog. Let me get that right. It's, yes, theyflyblog.com. Small business entrepreneurs, do you want to optimize your website, get more business, but your budget is small? So what's your wish list? A professional look, a blog site where you edit and create pages yourself integrated with social media tools? This is Jeff Rents for FreeSpiritDesignStudio.com with Scott and Karen Teeters. You can get a great-looking turnkey 3.0 WordPress website very inexpensively. Your new site will be professionally designed, set up fast with search engine, social media, and blog optimization. And you'll be trained how to easily maintain your own new site. Get a free consultation today with absolutely no obligation from FreeSpiritDesignStudio.com. Take the first step to owning a site that your business deserves, created by FreeSpiritDesignStudio.com.